Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. We absolutely support Israel's right to defend itself in line with international law. We need to safeguard financial stability. 2024 is not going to be an easy year. We used to call it the dream of home ownership. But look at Britain now. We've got to hang on to optimism and hope because it is the biggest driver of change. Let's stop thinking of life in terms of Brexit. Let's move on and look for the future. Hello, you're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm James Wilcock. Now, we left off on Friday, James, talking about the dangers to MPs from an increasingly feverish debate about the Israel-Hamas war. I come to the start of this week, though, thinking about the dangers from MPs. So this is Lee Anderson, former deputy chairman uh, of the Conservative Party, who has been suspended after he claimed that Islamists had, quote, got control of London and of the mayor, Sadiq Khan. Now, under pressure, the prime minister has said this morning that the comments were unacceptable and wrong, but he didn't call them racist or Islamophobic. Now, Sadiq Khan says that the comments clearly crossed a line. But these comments from a senior Conservative are Islamophobic, are anti-Muslim and are racist. We've seen over the last uh, two days uh, confirmation that over the last few months there's been an increase in anti-Muslim cases by more than 330%. Uh, These comments uh, pour fuel on the fire of anti-Muslim hatred. So that was the London Mayor Sadiq Khan there. Now, on top of, of course, the comments that we were discussing on Friday, Liz Truss, the former prime minister at this MAGA event in the United States with Steve Bannon, the Trump acolyte, you know, when Bannon uh, said in front of her that the far right extremist Tommy Robinson was a hero in Bannon's view and Truss didn't react. So some deep concerns about what's going on in the Conservative Party. I mean, yeah, you pick two very high profile Conservatives here. I think you've got to know that we are going into a by-election that serves in Rochelle in a Labour safe seat where Labour do not have a candidate in the seat. A politician's number one job to get elected and the party have no candidate because the man put forward by Labour, Azhar Ali, said Israel had allowed the 7th of October attacks by Hamas as a pretext to invade Gaza, something that is patently untrue and caused him to be suspended by the party. I mean, while we're here, if you dig into the list of candidates who are suspended by Labour, you also see a certain Jeremy Corbyn, former leader of the party. So you can also go toe to toe with the Conservatives on high profile figures who have been suspended. Mm. Um on the by-elections, Caroline, it's even worth saying this coming by-election, the candidate for the Green Party is also no longer being endorsed by the party after past comments about towards the Muslim faith and the conflict in Gaza came to light. Mm. So, look, worth saying also that a lot of people in both parties have bu- publicly disowned a, you know, a number of these individuals. And you've got other parties who have weighed in. The Lib Dems deputy leader Daisy Cooper saying that Sunak should have condemned Lee Anderson's comments uh, as racist and Islamic phobic. So I just think it shows this level of heightened tension. It's not just affecting sort of people and communities. It's also kind of really fracturing you know, the political parties themselves. I mean, the question we've got to ask ourselves when we're talking to you a bit with our next guest is why? Like, is this mm. uh, a case of what is going on in the Middle East? Is this a case of social media? Is this a case of a general election campaign, which in, for some MPs are very, very worried about their seats and trying to manoeuvre in ways they think will fit their demographics? I There aren't easy answers, but what seems quite interesting and clear is that both parties are taking a lot of action to defend their reputations from people on their fringes and are splintering. Yeah, absolutely. So joining us now is our senior UK government reporter, Alex Wickham. Alex, welcome to the programme. Well, let's start then and weigh in, would you, on Lee Anderson. Um, The spotlight firmly on Conservatives. There seemed to be a bit of a change in language from Rishi Sunak, but he has not called the comments racist or Islamophobic. Yeah, it's a It's a sort of fascinating insight into this kind of pseudo intellectual debate that some right wing conservatives love to have about Islamophobia or anti Muslim hatred and which is the right term to use, which is the right definition. Basically, what can you say and what can't you say Mm. about Islam, the religion and about uh, Muslims and you know the Anderson comments essentially saying that Sadiq Khan is controlled by Islamists um, you know I think 
clearly crossed the line into into basically outright racism and that's why the conservatives have have suspended him they're all coming out today rishi sunak saying that that anderson's comments were wrong but he doesn't quite the prime minister want to say why he thinks they were wrong because the tories have this sort of difficult internal debate because they want some right-wing tories to be able to push the boundaries of what you can say about islam in particular as a religion and that you know kemi badenoch who is equalities minister as well as business secretary she weighed in as she has been doing a lot recently Mm. last night and she said well, we shouldn't use the word Islamophobia, basically because we should be able to criticise Islam. And the thing we should be interested in is anti-Muslim hatred being the sort of bad thing that isn't allowed. So they're having this sort of debate. It's all pretty awkward. I think most normal people would just look at it and go, what on earth are they doing? Do you have a sense of what the mood, or if there is even a singular mood, inside the parliamentary party right now? Because they work so hard in the past couple of weeks to try and turn the attention onto Labour's divisions over this issue. And yet we start this Monday a week where there is a by-election talking about the Conservative Party. Keir Starmer, it's often said he's a lucky general. You know, whenever things go wrong for Keir Starmer, 28 billion green spending, internal rows about between advisers, all sorts of stuff, anti-Semitism, something happens in the Tory party where they come and get all the attention. And Lee Anderson has, has you know, inserted himself into the into the front pages with this row Starmer will be thinking thank goodness after you know last week pretty pretty uh, horrible scenes in the commons with the with the row over the of the speaker and 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 Gaza and all of that stuff um so yeah I, you know, once again the Tories are, are sort of bailing Starmer out and and what the Tories need if they're ever going to have any hope of closing the gap at all with Labour is a period of discipline where they all stick to the line and allow Keir Starmer to make some mistakes and put the focus onto Labour. It's just never happening because any time Starmer makes a mistake, the Tories' ill discipline comes back to the fore. A, a period, you know. Um, all right, use, using that term. Um, in terms of the the rhetoric, you know, the, the UK has many issues as we go into this probably general election year to deal with you can rattle them off right this is a war that is happening a long way away from britain do you think that this is a sort of flavor of the of the language of the um the the language that we're going to see in this campaign i mean this is bitter it's divisive it's it's a it's a really tough one there are some tories Bizarrely, who who want to make the election, you know, about Labour's problems on Gaza, because it is a difficult topic for mm. all politicians, but it's particularly a difficult topic for Labour. They've had problems, obviously, with anti-Semitism over the last, you know, five, ten years. They, as you can see from the Azar Ali story and how Keir Starmer handled it, they find it very difficult, the Labour Party, to, to get this right. Um, and the Tories would quite like to sort of be able to paint Labour as a party where there is a doubt about what they really stand for, who they really stand for, and just ask that ask sort of very difficult questions that, you know, perhaps people wouldn't want to talk about publicly, but the Tories could do a little bit of wink, wink, nudge, nudge on it. And the, But the problem is, the flip side of it, there is almost a mirror where mm. for the Tories, uh, in the same way with uh, Labour and, and Jewish people, people the tories and muslims have have the flip side where you know there are some tories who really do push the limit of what of what is acceptable to say as we've seen with anderson is this a sign of rishi sunak slipping authority that he can't keep people on the line like this or is this a sign of sort of social media the debate the general election like was this inevitable or is this you know something we should look read into it's, it's it's been a problem. The Conservative Party and Islamophobia has been a problem for years. I mean, there was they set up a, their own sort of inquiry into into Conservative Party Islamophobia five or six years ago because of stories kept cropping up a bit like this. Nothing really happened as a result. So it is something that's that's happened every every now and then. Obviously, there's the the Israel Hamas war, which is which is you know increasing tensions again as well. But I think the other thing, uh, as you allude to, is the sort of the Tory leadership contest, mm. which is <laughs> which is coming up, and this the, Rishi Sunak's lack of authority is lack of control over the party and the it creates worse discipline among conservative mps it creates this situation where liz truss is going to cpac in america yes. spouting off about you know hanging out with steve bannon and 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 you know other assorted sort of 
cranks. You've got Suella Braveman chipping in with with some you know, pretty punchy rhetoric. You've got Lee Anderson. You've got Kemi Badenoch tweeting all the time, inserting herself into every row that she can get into, really because she wants to show Tory right wing Tory members. I'm your person for the next contest. And so that's what it shows. The problem is for the party and for Rishi Sunak is it just makes them look a bit like a rabble going into the election. They were all sort of, you know, throwing themselves into all sorts of inflammatory language. Mm. And I think voters kind of, yes, I'm sure the Israel-Gaza war is an issue for many voters, but is it the top issue in terms of everything that's happening in this country? You know, I imagine Rishi Sunak would want to be talking about the economy the budget that's coming up, things like that. And yet all of the different factions of his party are arguing about other things. Yeah, and we haven't even gotten on to the speaker. Again, the other uh, sort of row that is a hangover from last Wednesday, um, dozens of MPs now want him to resign. What do you, where do you peg the chances of him staying on? The momentum against Lindsay Hoyle, the common speaker, has, has slightly sort of the stings come out of it a little bit as 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 we've had the weekend, basically, and MPs have gone home and calmed down a little bit. It could it could reignite. Um, you, you know, it, it, the Tories currently, the government are standing by Hoyle. That could change. I mean, he's put himself in a really difficult spot, Hoyle, because essentially he's got. One party, the SNP, who have no confidence in him, that's a tough place for, I suppose, you know, independent speaker to be in the House of Commons. He's got quite a few Tory MPs pretty unimpressed with him as well. I imagine the government's pretty unimpressed with him. So he is in a difficult spot. I mean, I, I imagine most people in Westminster kind of want this to sort of fade away a little bit over the next couple of days rather than have, you know, a repeat of last week's scenes, which mm. I think, to be honest, I don't think anybody came out well out of that. Starmer being seen to put pressure on the speaker, you know, not really a great look. SNP being seen to play a bit of politics, Tories as well. So I don't think anybody came out. Lindsay Hoyle didn't come out of it well at all either. So I think most people will probably want to move on. Whether that happens is another question. That was our senior UK government reporter, Alex Wickham. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, meanwhile, there has been another pretty interesting story, again, on an issue that surely will be far more bread and butter for many, many voters in the UK. Britain's top competition regulator has a message. The housing market is not working. Well, you might have been asleep if you hadn't got that message so far. But the Competition and Markets Authority is the independent, powerful watchdog. And they have been looking at the housing sector for over a year. They have some pretty damning conclusions. Now, the CEO of the CMA, Sarah Cardell, has been speaking to Bloomberg. Have a listen to what she said. The markets need significant interventions to deliver enough good quality homes in the places that people need them. This is a complex policy space where there are important decisions to be taken by elected governments, the UK government, the Scottish and Welsh government too. What we've done in our report is put forward a series of proposals for consideration that we believe could significantly improve the way that the planning system is working. So Sarah Cardell there with her fundamental concerns at the CMA and the regulator saying that they believe a substantial intervention in the house building market is necessary. It is rare you hear a regulator call on the government to take significant action to fix a marketplace, especially after being asked to do an inquiry onto the issue. I mean, and furthermore, I mean, we'll come on to this later with our next guest, like there is now going to be a competition review into house builders for potentially, potentially fixing prices. Um, it highlights or sharing information about prices for new bills. Creating a cartel yes. is the investigation. I mean, not only that, though, in some ways, what is going to be some of the longer term impacts of this is saying that there is a problem with providing quality housing in the UK. Uh, there's a highlighting private developers who are trying to make sure they get a return on their house price. There's nothing. This is, this is Caroline. Again, you said like, oh, you, you would be asleep at the wheel if you didn't know this was going on in the housing market. But to hear it from the Competition and Markets Authority is quite something. I mean, again, Cardell stresses that the need here is for the government to take action. Ultimately, a lot of the decisions that need to be taken to improve the way the house building market is working really are decisions for elected governments. This is a complex policy space. We have used our 
in-depth market study to provide information and objective analysis to support governments in taking those decisions. Now, separately, where we identify evidence that suggests there is anti-competitive behaviour, uh, sharing of information in relation to confidential prices and other data, now that clearly is an area for us to tackle directly, and that's why we've launched the separate Competition Act investigation today. So Sarah Cardell speaking there. Well, that second investigation is looking into eight home builders to find out if they shared commercially sensitive information as a way to keep house prices higher. This is a probe, though, the beginning of a probe. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you are guilty, obviously. But the CMA does have the power to fine firms. And so it is a serious allegation. So let's get a bit more then on this story. Bloomberg's Matthew Brooker joins us now for more. Um, Matthew, a very good morning to you. Just firstly, on the eight home builders, this is a new bit of information that we've had up uh, this morning from the CMA. What is the specific concern that the CMA has about information sharing? How serious is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, this is a sort of basic plank of, of antitrust law, I think, in most places that, you know, when, when if producers get together and discuss their prices and um, you know, whether tacitly or not, agree to set them at a certain level, then that's anti-competitive behaviour. So I think it's pretty clear what they're getting at when they talk about that and why information sharing would be a concern to the competition regulator. So, Matthew, you wrote just a few weeks ago that you was like that UK house builders were shown from chutzpah uh, amid this probe, looking at a merger while it was ongoing. How much of a shock do you think these house builders woke up to with the potential strength of this report? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know uh, how surprised they would be. If I was Barrett or Red Row, I think I'd be a little bit nervous this morning. Uh, I, I mean, um, you know, the t- the, the, just the timing of the announcement of that merger uh, was, I think, kind of interesting coming just a couple of weeks before the CMA was was due to report back on this, uh, you know, this year-long uh, study that they've made into the house building sector. Uh, so you might have thought, you know, might have kind of tempting fate a bit to, 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 you know, I mean, one of the concerns was market concentration and the dominance of big developers. So to announce a merger of two of the biggest developers that would extend Barrett's lead at the top, uh, yeah, kind of uh, pr- provocative. And uh, I think mm. the Barrett chairman said, you know, we're very confident that this is going to, uh, this isn't going to run into any problems with the regulators. It's going to get antitrust clearance. Mm. Uh, I mean, I took that as, a, as, as a, a really a kind of signal that the CMA was unlikely to take any, you know, very robust action. But, you know, that may have been, um, that may have been wrong looking at what they've done today. Yeah, and the, Eight home builders, so they include Barrett, but also Bellway, Berkeley, Bloor Homes, Persman, Red Road, Taylor Wimpy and Vistry. And you talk about nervousness. I mean, you could see that in the stock markets this morning and indeed um, throughout throughout the morning in London, that um, those the share prices of those home builders uh, were being knocked just a little bit, you know, two, three percent. So not dramatic, but still, you know, investors surely signalling a little bit of nervousness. As you say, that the CMA, um, the year-long review, which is sort of separate to the um, competition investigation now, the year-long review and the recommendations that they put forwards for government are also really, they're eye-catching. I mean, they're not, they're not surprising, frankly, if you try to buy a home in the UK, but the <laughs> strength of it is, is interesting. And they talk about the lack of new homes being built, the, the persistent under-delivery of of new homes and often the poor quality of new homes the fact that home builders um sorry home buyers don't don't get a lot of um sort of choice and and feedback from the home builders and support uh you know once they've actually built that new home yeah you know as you say i think a lot of these issues are familiar to people who are in the market or you know people who are buyers um, there is a bias against buying new builds. I mean, I think the majority of like, surveys I've seen is that the majority of people wouldn't consider buying a new build because they've got such a reputation for quality issues and then poor, you know, when you try and get defects 
uh, repaired and so on, it can be very difficult and it can take a long time. Uh, there's not really a, a very good consumer protection mechanism there. So, yes, a lot of it's not surprising, but, it, it, you know, the, 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 this, this report, I think, does give quite a damning picture uh, of the industry and it, it, it really acts as kind of independent confirmation of what we all know kind of anecdotally. So then the CMA recommending the government should set up a homes ombudsman, you know, to help with the quality control issues, that the council should take over the running of amenities for all new housing estates. I mean, councils, a lot of them are going, you know, quite a number of them are going bankrupt up and down the country. Is this feasible? Uh, yes, uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why Essentially, I think what the CMA is doing here in a lot of areas is basically punting these decisions back to the government uh, because they do involve, you know, they, they are in, in the end political decisions. I mean, they involve trade-offs. If you spend, if you spend the money here, you can't spend the money somewhere else, and that's, you know, the competition regulator is really there as a kind of referee to uh, uh, decide whether. Uh, people are playing playing the game right according to the rules. I mean, they don't establish the rules of the game. Uh, so I think you know, in, the, in, in on this question of whether you know roads and sewers and public amenities should be adopted by councils. I mean, councils are supposed to be responsible for these things in the first place. Um, and it's I, I mean, I think this is a you know a giant scandal really that the uh, uh, house builders build these private estates and then. Uh, have management, private management companies take over responsibility for them, who then charge the um, the home buyers, you know, what can be very high management fees for managing these these uh, these amenities, um, and home buyers have very little control over it. I mean, they, it's very difficult for them to, you know, say say the management company is not doing a good job it's very difficult for them to fire them and, and replace them. I mean, sometimes they can't at all. And, you know, I think that the fundamental principle here is that these are public amenities. I mean, they're not just for the people who, the roads, for example, that go through a private estate aren't just used by the people who live in that estate. They're, they're, they're public roads that anyone can use. And so they should really be um, the responsibility of councils. Whether councils have got the money to do that is, of course, another question. As you say, Matthew, they've punted that back to the government. Something I found quite surprising on reading the report this morning is that it was such a strong call for government action on something that Keir Starm and the Labour Party have made a central plank of their election. I wouldn't go as far as the manifesto yet, but pledges. Let's go with. Um, Is that unusual for a regulator to make such a sort of strong call for government action um and do you think that tallies with a lot of what labor want to do um well you know i, I mean i kind of feel the way the way i read it is that uh, the, the cma carried out this study at the request of michael Gove, the, the the housing secretary um the way i read it is that you know, you're, you're asking us to fix problems which aren't really the job of a regulator. They're the job of government. They're, these are political decisions. And so here's what we think needs to be done in some areas, or here are the choices that you face. But these aren't issues that we can fix. Uh, they, they're, 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 they're deeper questions, mm. deeper issues than... Uh, you know, a, a market re- regulator can really decide on. And I, and I think that's correct. I think they're right about yeah. that. No, absolutely. And the CMA is critical of the planning rules in the UK, which have long been understood to be sort of preventing more building. You know, they talk about there being too many stakeholders and that planners, planning departments in councils are underfunded. Again, this is sort of not news to anyone who uh, keeps an eye on kind of home building. I suppose... What I would love to understand from you, Matthew, how do you understand the impact on home builders? What do you think the defence of the house builders is going to be? Because at various points in the last 20, 30 years, UK house builders have been under huge pressure in terms of sort of making returns because of the difficulties of of building and so on. What do you think the defence of the home builders will be to all of this? 
Oh, well, you know, they've, they've made elaborate, very long defences of, of uh, the way they operate all the way through this year-long inquiry. I mean, if you, you can look on the CMA's market study page and, you know, they've all made long submissions. So they've got their, you know, they, they, they've made their case at length. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, you, to, an, to an extent, I mean, for one thing, all right, they have... Yeah, they have their issues uh, they have to deal with, um, but they have done pretty well, really, I, I, through the cycle. I mean, they, they're pretty profitable, um, uh, generally. I mean, you know, when you go in, it's a very cyclical business, obviously, property. Mm. And when you go into a downturn, then, then they do face issues. But, you know, you look through the cycles, they've done, they, they do pretty well. You can't, I think you can't blame the house builders for responding to the incentives of the system as it is now. I mean, they didn't set up the system. They, they've played it well, but that's the way the system is. Um, so if, if, if it's produced yep. dysfunctional results for Britain as a country, then you have to change the system. And that's not the job, I think, of the CMA. That's the job yeah. of the government. Our opinion column is Matthew Brooker. Thank you very much for joining us. OK, so a call to change the system when it comes to home builders. That's it from us for today. If you like the programme, don't forget to subscribe and give it five stars so that other people can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen. This episode was produced by Tiwa Adebayo and our audio engineer was Marufa Hussain. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm James Wilcock. We'll be back with more tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg UK Politics. Listen weekdays at noon on DAB Digital Radio in London.